Hey everyone, Brendan Snyder here. How are you? Thanks so much for joining me and welcome to another episode of New Music Finds. So this is where I like to collect together all the different things that I've purchased over the past week and I get it from a lot of different places. Online retail like Amazon, eBay and more. My local record store like Sound Exchange. But I also hit up a brand new record store and if you follow my channel then you've already seen the Let's Go to the Record Store video where I filmed the experience of that and that was for High Fidelity Records in Amityville, New York and I got a lot of cool things from there. So this particular week, a big week uh, because I've got all different uh, things coming in from different places like that and we'll get into it here in just a bit but before we start if you're new to my channel and haven't already hit the subscribe button please do also leave a comment hit like all those things do help support my channel I'd greatly appreciate it and if you turn on notifications you won't miss any videos like that let's go to the record store video that is already posted about this new record store that I hit up but let's get into this here 25 things to talk about and I always like to kick off with brand new releases. And even though these are a couple weeks old here because it just took it longer to get to me, I had to order them. None of the local record stores had them. They're still new, and so I still want to kick off with them. And the first one up is Midnight Oil frontman Peter Garrett, his second solo album. Um, this one here, a little different than um, you know the past one that he did. This is called True North. Just came out about two weeks ago, I think. And this one here doesn't really sound as much like Midnight Oil as the first solo album that he did that was, I don't know, six or seven years earlier. In between there, they did get back together and release a Midnight Oil album. What's interesting here is we got the guitar player from Midnight Oil on this album. You would think it would make it sound even more like Midnight Oil, but it actually doesn't. Uh, not to say that it is a bad record, but it does sound a little bit different. Of course, we've got Peter Garrett's uh, defining vocals on it, which to me, anytime you hear that, it sounds like Midnight Oil. So pretty much if you are a fan of Midnight Oil, you might want to check out this brand new Peter Garrett solo album called True North. All right, and then there was a reissue from Gentle Giant, The Missing Piece. Uh, this one here being a Stephen Wilson remix version of the 1977 classic album from them. My personal, or one of my personal favorites from the band. And I really enjoy hearing what Stephen Wilson does to these things. And he's gotten, uh, you know, hooked up with a lot of different prog rock bands. Jethro Tull, uh, one of the other ones that he's done this with. But he's he's gotten in and done remixes for so many different artists now and it really puts a different spin on these albums it just in my opinion enhances what these things are um i haven't uh, opened this one as you can see this one's still sealed here i literally just got it and i haven't cracked into it because i've got so much other stuff going through i don't like to open something if i'm not really ready to dive into it and devour it but i never file it away until i've actually opened it so sometimes i get the comment that people think that i've got stuff on the cd walls behind me that i've never listened to and that's not true uh, I have listened to every CD I have ever purchased. I may not open it right away, and I may wait a week or so on it until I actually have some downtime to really check it out. I'm maybe not devouring something else, but I listen to everything that I purchase. So one of the artists that I had recently gotten into, or I should really say had a resurgence in, is Joe Satriani. So Joe Satriani, Steve Vai got together, did their first collaboration. These guys have known each other for 50 years, and they did a digital single, um, something, uh, I can't remember, Sea of Emotion, I think it was called. And really great, and it just made me really want to sort of recheck out Joe Satriani. I've always loved Steve Vai. I would hands down say he's probably my favorite guitar player of the shred style. Um, but Joe Satriani, I've always enjoyed, I've always liked, but I've never been a huge fan of his. Yet, I've owned, up until now, 16 of his studio albums. Uh, he's got 18 total, so I picked up the two that I didn't own. These two, Time Machine, which was an interesting one. I think this was 1993. So first disc, all studio, second disc, live. Um, the studio stuff on here was outtakes and leftover songs. So it wasn't necessarily new stuff. There was some new, I think, that was part of this, but it wasn't like it was an entirely brand new studio album at the time. But it still gets classified as one of his studio albums because the first disc is all studio and the second disc is live. But I picked that up and uh, this one here, which is called uh, Is There Love in Space? And this features the song If I Could Fly, which 
The album itself and that song became much more famous. Wines Coldplay released their song, uh, Viva La Vida, and suddenly uh, Joe Satriani was saying, hey, uh, that song rips off my song, uh, If I Could Fly, and they fi he filed a lawsuit over it. It was found to be in his favor, and they settled for an undisclosed amount of money or however it is that they're uh, resolving that. But if you listen to the Joe Satriani instrumental song, you'll totally hear the Coldplay song, um, Viva La Vida in it. So, um, but I picked that up, add that to the collection, and now have finished off my Joe Satriani uh, collection there. And another artist that I only just recently like dug deep into is Roxy Music. I've had a best of from them for quite some time, and I have to say it never really clicked with me, maybe because it opened with such a slow song, um, Avalon. And I picked it up for the song um, More Than This, which was covered by 10,000 Maniacs, and I knew that. None of the other stuff really clicked with me at the time, but you know, sometimes if you're not in the mood for things, it just doesn't do it. But I'm getting ready to film a video with Pete Pardo, Sia Tranquilli. He invited me onto his channel. One of the bands we're gonna be discussing is Roxy Music, so I thought, you know what? Better brush up on my Roxy Music. And I popped on that best of, and it just clicked. It was really good. So I started filling in the gaps in my Roxy Music collection. And uh, this one here, Flesh and Blood. Um, this one here, I think this is a 1980 or 81. Um, I definitely end up finding that I like the later era of Roxy Music more than the early era of the band. Uh, Sirens and Country Music, one of the ones that has a controversial album cover on it, always has. Um, but luckily it is still, you know, the way that you can get it. I don't like it when they modify things and change album art, but I picked those three up and, uh, just being, getting into Roxy Music, I found there to be a lot of Brian Ferry solo stuff. So I started by picking up Best of Brian Ferry and lo and behold, it did the exact same thing. It made me really like the solo stuff by Brian Ferry, separate from Roxy Music. And so from that, um, I hit up uh, that new record store that I was telling you about, High Fidelity Records in Amityville, New York. And I'll get into all that stuff in just a bit. But one of the things that I bought from there was the 1985 album, Boys and Girls. And initially I thought this was maybe his debut solo album or something. It wasn't until I started to really sit down and go through it that I found out that is his, I believe the sixth solo album that he actually had albums going back to 1973. But those, most of those, three or four of those were covers albums. So somewhere along the way he does record, you know, an all original one, but uh, this one here, definitely the biggest of his solo releases, uh, both for the UK and the US, going gold in the US. And um, pop this on and same thing, man, just loved it. So I'm right in the thick of a Roxy Music kick right now and really enjoying that. All right, but as I said, hit up this new record store at High Fidelity and I got, I picked up a total of 20 things from there. Um, I'm actually only showing you about 17 of them because some of the stuff I was picking up just to replace other versions of, and I don't really think there's any need to go through that, but like if you watched my, or you want to see everything and you want to check out the scores from the record store, there's a few more things in that. That, that shows everything. But also I want to talk about where when I went, did that video, that was brand new, just got home, excited about it, taking the stuff out of the bag, haven't listened to it, haven't... Uh, you know, dived into it or anything like that. And, you know, I made some mistakes on stuff and I'm going to correct that here. But as always, when I'm talking about that stuff, I'm going to do the research on it later. I'm going to get into it. So I found out a lot more. And I think one of them being was this, where I think I might've said, I thought this was his first solo album, but of course it turned out to not be. And that's part of the fun. You know, you buy something, you might think it's one way and you get into it and you find out a whole bunch of other stuff. So one of the things I picked up that I didn't expect to be as uh, sort of hard hitting with me as it was, Best of Uriah Heep. I've got just about every Uriah Heep album, but it, they've never been a band that has bowled me over, especially the early stuff. Because I got into the band much later, around 1999, Sonic Origami was the first thing I ever bought by them. And I bought that because the band had Trevor Boulder, Lee Kurtzlick, guys that I knew from other stuff. Um, 
but I've only recently just picked up a couple of the early albums, really enjoying those. So I thought, let me pick up a best of. And I gotta say, this here is awesome. This is making me really rethink Uriah Heep, especially those early years. And so kind of having a reverse uh, effect on me where I had the albums, but now buying a best of is making me reinvestigate it. Whereas sometimes I buy the best of, and then it makes me go out and buy all the individual albums. Uh, this next one here, didn't think this was going to do anything either, and it totally did. John Kay and Steppenwolf, a 1987 album that's called Rock and Roll Rebels, and it's full-on 80s sounding. So some of you guys may be rolling your eyes or groaning because I'm saying how much I like this album. But this did it for me, man. I really enjoyed it. Uh, apparently very hard to come by on uh, CD. It was later reissued. Uh, I think under a different name with a different album art in like 1993 or something. But uh, this is the original uh, release of it. And I really, really like it. Um, Richie Fure. So I made a mistake of saying that I thought he was the bassist that joined up with the Eagles. And then kind of while I was saying all of it, I was correcting myself. But ultimately, um, looked up his name afterwards and realized, okay, he does have connection to Poco. But he wasn't one of the bass players like Timothy B. Schmidt or Randy Meisner. So uh, my, the connection with him was simply just the Poco. But as soon as I saw the name, I knew he was someone and I just couldn't pinpoint it at the time. But pick this up. I think this is his uh, debut solo album, uh, Dance a Little Light, and it's on Wounded Bird. And basically, whenever I see something on Wounded Bird, I just grab it. This stuff is so hard to come by and usually turns out to be right up my alley. Basically, anything that Wounded Bird has released, Rock Candy Records, seems to be the guys that run those labels seem to have the same taste in music that I do. And I saw this and I said, you know, I know he has something to do with Poco, the Eagles. I'm going to pick this up and glad that I did. It turned out to be really great. Also picked up Paul Kelly. Uh, this a &M Records release, also not his first, um, I thought it was. Uh, turns out he has albums that go back to, I think, 1981. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, this on the front of it here, and it's a U.S. copy of this, is Paul Kelly and the Messengers. So I go to Wikipedia to look this up to do a little more research on it. And I discover, oh, he's got earlier, you know, solo albums. And then I go, wait a minute, where is Paul Kelly and the Messengers? There was one in there that was called Paul Kelly and the Colored Girls. And it, it, they are both called Under the Sun. And it turns out that was the name of the album in Australia. But so that it didn't cause any issues uh, racial wise or anything like that. For international markets, they changed it to Paul Kelly and the Messengers. Um, if for some reason you're you know in another part of the country and you don't know what that means, the term colored girls refers to black women and is seen to be a derogatory term now. And with the United States and its uh, past dealing with slavery and um, civil rights movement and all of that, it was just not seen in good taste to release an album called Paul Kelly and the Colored Girls, but it was actually a joke that they took the line from the Lou Reed song in Wild's Walk on the Wild Side, where he says, and the colored girls go, and then they sing the background lines. Um, so it's interesting how, you know, times change and uh, something that was seen to be okay at that time is not okay today and so forth. Uh, we have that happen in left and right. A little too much, in my opinion, with everything having to be politically correct all the time. But I get it. I understand. Anyway, that was just an interesting thing about this as to why the U.S. one is called Paul Kelly and the Messengers. All right. Uh, Frankie Miller album. This one here called uh, Once in a Blue Moon, early album from 1972. This is a 1998 reissue on the uh, repertoire label. A uh, UK singer, no, it might be Scottish. Sorry, I know I do that sometimes and I apologize. I've got 12,000 plus CDs here. And I've got even more music knowledge up here. And I don't always get it right. And I apologize when I do make the mistake on something. But I had recently gotten into um, Frankie Miller because Spike of the London Choir Boys, which is an English band, uh, he did a whole solo album called 100% Frankie Miller. 
And at that time, I didn't know who Frankie Miller was. I just liked Spike from the Choir Boys. So doing the research on that led me to find out who Frankie Miller was and I uh, picked up some Frankie Miller and found out I really, really liked it. If you like Spike, if you like the London Choir Boys, you like that sound, that raspy, straight up rock and roll, uh, classic old school sound. Frankie Miller, man, that's where it's at. Uh, Choir Boys totally um, basing their style on that, along with, you know, Faces, Rolling Stones, things like that. But I had never heard anything from Frankie Miller or knew who that was. And it's just like finding a long lost friend, man. The stuff fits like a glove. It is so good. And so I picked up one of those five CD packages, little box sets that has them in the cardboard sleeves. Great to get, 20 bucks. I got a bunch of Frankie Miller right off the bat. But now, as I'm finding them in jewel cases, I'm throwing them back into the collection that way. And eventually I'll get rid of that little box set once I have found every album. I picked up two Jean-Luc Ponty albums. And I always seem to make the mistake where I'm saying the guy is jazz. I don't hear it as jazz. I hear it as prog rock. And then people remind me that he's actually classified as um, fusion. And uh, fusion where mixing prog, rock, jazz, maybe other stuff as well. And that's really, I think, why I don't hear this is jazz music. The guy's always classified in jazz. If I go into a record store, they don't have fusion sections. So it always sticks into my head that Jean-Luc Ponty is under jazz. If I go to Sound Exchange, it's under jazz. If I go to uh, where I was, uh, High Fidelity Records, these were under jazz. Uh, so I've just gotten that in my head, but he's actually fusion, and that makes more sense to me. If you are a fan of prog rock and you've never checked out Jean-Luc Ponty, I highly recommend it. He's a violinist. Um, he's got killer other musicians that play with him. One of these albums, I want to say might be this one, I can't remember. Daryl Sturmer, who is guitar player, was guitar player with Genesis and backed up Phil Collins and a number of other people. He's a very famous sideman, more than he is, you know, an artist in his own right. But they've always had, or he always had, uh, great musicians with him, Jean-Luc Ponty. And I know him from pairing up with John Anderson um, of Yes fame. They did an album together, and that blew my mind. And from there, I went down the rabbit hole of buying Jean-Luc Ponty albums. All right. Um, another band, uh, synth you know, band, fusion band, whatever you want to call it. Tangerine Dream, uh, Force Majeure, 1979, great album. I didn't know what to expect with this. It was just a used copy. Their stuff is hard to come by. And I like some of the other later albums. My favorite album by Tangerine Dream is uh, Stratosphere, F-E-A-R, Stratosphere. I like the play on the, the term because it should be P-H-E-R-E, -E, I think is how it's spelled. Um, and I, you know, so I like some of their stuff, but it's kind of hit or miss for me. And I really like that synth laden sound. This one turned out to be very much along those lines. And I'm very happy with this. So if you're wanting to get into Tangerine Dream and don't really know where to start, I would recommend Stratosphere, which is 75, 76, I can't remember. And this one, Force Majeure, 1979. Those two, at least for me, really, really good. All right, I've got eight more to still run through with you guys. Um, Samson, 1988, I found out a bit more about this one here. So uh, they had an EP in 1988 of five songs, but when this album came out in 1993, they added six more unreleased tracks to it to make a full-length album. So while I have those five songs from the EP, I didn't have the rest of this. So that turned out to be really cool. Um, sometimes I'm buying things, and, and I even said this when I was doing my um, scores from the record store, that I thought I had everything on this album, but it turns out I didn't. So I was really glad that I took the chance and I picked it up. I was buying it just to get it all combined together under this 1988 LP, which I knew I didn't have, uh, but I didn't know that what I actually had the tracks from was only the five-song EP, and that this is a full-length album score <laughs> in the biggest sense. The Angels, killer Australian band. Uh, this album here, 1989, called Beyond Salvation. And I learned this from Wikipedia, but a lot of you guys 
uh, started telling me after I had posted the video that yes, the US edition of this is very different than the Australian edition. It's got three or four new songs from the album that came out in Australia called Beyond Salvation and the rest of them are re-recorded songs of hits. So one of the ones that I knew um, early on was Am I Ever Gonna See Your Face Again? That is a re-recording here, but the reason that I found out and wanted to get into the Angels was that um, I knew the name Brewster Neeson Brewster from seeing it with Great White and specifically the song Can't Shake It, although I think they may have covered a few other songs. I can't remember if Face the Day is also their song, but they've covered a couple Angel songs and I always really liked them. And I was like, I love Great White and I love these songs. Who is this band? And that's what made me go down the road of it. So now whenever I come across an Angels album, I pick it up, throw it into the collection. Okay, band The Voices, MCA Records, 1989. Didn't know anything about the band. Actually, still don't know anything about the band, but I just took a chance on it because these guys looked like they would rock, and they did. This is a self-titled release, The Voices, but let you just check out that back picture there. And it was really more when I opened up the booklet and, you know, just saw these guys, uh, you know, with that rock and roll look. And, uh, you know, the way this was done, the fact that it's 1989 and it's on MCA Records. And, you know, back in the day, we had to be pretty good at that, looking at album art, looking at the way a band looked to say, you know what, these guys are going to be my kind of music. And you took a chance. For me, most of the time, it always paid off. And here's one that I did take a chance on, and it did pay off. While I know the name of the band, I didn't know anything about them. I had seen this album cover around, but never bought anything. And I'm really glad that I did. Banshee, Race Against Time. I bought it because it's from the 80s. This one here, uh, 1989 also, and on Atlantic Records. And if I see any band uh, from the 80s era on Atlantic Records that looks like metal, I pick it up because I just had really good luck with that stuff. But this turned out to be really good. I thought this was gonna be more high-pitched scream style vocals, heavy metal, and there was a lot of hard rock on this as well, making it even more enjoyable for me. Took a chance on this one, the band IQ, and it's called uh, Living Proof. It's a live album, actually, although the first track, you wouldn't know it was a live album, and that's what I listened to until I got to the second track, and I said, why are there you know, uh, an audience in here. And then I found out it was a live album, but um, a neo prog band that started in the very early 80s. They recorded this live album for, uh, it wasn't the BBC, but it was some network like that. And then the album got released in, I want to say 87, 86, 87, somewhere around there without the band's knowledge. And they felt it was subpar. So around, I think, 1993, they released this version, a far superior version of it that was remastered, and they felt really lived up to the band's live show. And I'm really enjoying it, but that is my first IQ album. And I uh, picked up Mark Bonilla, this sampler, five-song sampler from his album American Matador. Uh, this is 1993, came out on Reprise Records, so I had to say, you know, that was a major label. Mark Bonilla had a solo record. I didn't know that he did. And um, I like Mark Bonilla playing with Keith Emerson from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And he's popped up in some other places. So I thought, let me check it out. And this was really, really good. After listening to this, I went on eBay. I found the album, purchased it. I've got that being sent to me. So I'm going to have the whole album very shortly. Picked up a Baby's Anthology. This is one of those ones that I always thought I had and um, I've dug through the collection and come to the conclusion I never bought it because I think it's one of those ones that I always debated on buying, but I own all of the Babies albums. And it was just one of those ones I think I always ended up putting back in the end of the day and never picking up and I finally bought it. Now I have it in the collection and this way I can, you know, just pop on a collection when I want to check out the babies as opposed to picking which album because I always end up picking up the album that had Jonathan Cain on it where we had Ricky Phillips, Jonathan Cain, and John Waite, essentially a very early version of Bad English, um, instead of going and really listening to the rest of the stuff. And this way, it's going to help me explore that.
All right, and the last thing is SRC. I thought it stood for Scott Richardson Combo, which is not the case. Scott Richardson being the front man, it actually stands for Scott Richard Case. Um, I don't know why it's Scott Richard, not Scott Richardson. And I don't know what the word case or what the meaning of that has to do with it, but I looked it up right before filming this just to be able to answer that. And they're a um, late 60s band from Detroit, um, kind of along the line of the Stooges, although um, Wikipedia was saying they're a psychedelic band, but I just don't hear that in it. I hear much more of that raw sort of punk sound that was the Stooges. And um, I have an anthology of theirs that combines the two albums plus some singles, stuff like that. But I didn't own just the individual album itself and was glad to get a copy of this on One Way Records. And so there you go. That is 25 things I picked up this past week with a lot more information about it now. And that's always my favorite part of it. You know, sit down, put it on, start listening to this stuff. And I immediately start going to Wikipedia and checking things out. And nine times out of 10, I'm even happier with the information I find out about these albums after I've purchased them than the little bit that I knew up front that was the reason for purchasing it. For me, the more knowledge, the more information I have, the more enjoyment I get out of these things, which is one of the reasons I try to give you guys so much information from all of uh, you know my purchases, my top tens, my album reviews, the breakdown, the let's go to the record stores, all those things that I film, that's the reason I put all of that history and uh, background information in for you guys so that hopefully you too will enjoy your music a lot more. All right, everyone, take care, have a good one, and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.